Gritsi Railroad. A theme park up in the mountains of Blowing Rock, North Carolina. This theme park has brought in all sorts of visitors from the eastern region of the United States. There's rides, games, and even animals that you can feed up close. However, the main attraction of Tweetsie Railroad is its two historical steam locomotives. East Tennessee and Western North Carolina number 12, and White Pass and Yukon number 190. These two Baldwin-built locomotives have been operating at Tweetsie Railroad for a long time. But did you know these two locomotives had once lived very different lives before Tweetsie Road was even a thing? When theme parks are created, such as Bush Gardens in Williamsburg, Virginia, they'll include a train ride somewhere within the park. And these trains can be from electric power trains to real steam engines. However, what makes Tweetsie Railroad's engines special is that they once operated on their own railroads from the early to mid 20th century. But how did these two locomotives get to Tweetsie Railroad? Well, today we're going to be explaining the stories of Tweetsie No. 12 and Yukon Queen No. 190. So in order to understand how these two made it to Tweetsie Railroad, we need to go all the way back to the beginning of their lives. The story all begins with the East Tennessee and Western North Carolina Railroad during World War I. Five 460 Baldwin steam locomotives, number 9, 10, 11, 12, and 14 were ordered for the railroad's three-foot narrow-gauge line from 1911 to 1919 to operate and run the line from Johnson City to Cranberry. There would also be a number eight added later on in 1926, formerly from the Ratty Pan Railroad, who got it from the Twin Mountain and Potomac Railroad in 1911. This number 8 would replace the line's original number 8, which was way too light for the tracks it ran on. Number 12 was ordered on February 9th, 1917, and pulled passenger trains and freight trains between these two parts of the line, and would also help transport materials that were needed during World War I. And thus, number 12's story has started. After the First World War ended in 1918, Number 12 and her sisters continued operation as usual, pulling passenger trains and freight trains from point A to point B, as per usual. For a while, not much would really happen for Number 12 or her sisters during these early years of service. However, there would be one incident with Number 12 in the 1930s. During operations at the railroad's roundhouse, number 12 collided into the roundhouse. It's unsure how violent the collision was, but I'm sure it was nowhere as violent as the excavator collision of 475. And I only say that because the locomotive's number plate on the front was able to be repaired afterwards, 
But if you look really closely, you will be able to see cracks in the plate that show where it broke. As well as this, in 1932, one of 12 sisters, believed to be number 10, nearly fell off a trestle in Newland after the structure failed to hold up. Also, the number 8 engine would be scrapped in 1939. Nineteen forty one. World War Two is raging across the world, and the US has now joined in after the events at Pearl Harbor. The ET and WNC has been transporting more supplies than they ever have in their history. The narrow gauge part of the line has also been starting to decline in maintenance due to the war efforts, as well as the invention of truck transport starting to rise in favor. In 1942, two of 12 sisters, 10 and 14, were also sold off and given to the White Pass and Yukon Railroad up in Alaska to help out with the war efforts. After World War II ended on September 2nd, 1945, the world was now trying to return back to normal. However, several businesses were hindered severely during the war, with several of them going bankrupt or out of business entirely. The ET and WNC's narrow gauge system was declining rapidly and new it was not going to last for much longer. The ET and WNC's narrow gauge line only had three locomotives left running on it. Engines 9, 11, and 12. Closure of the line would be destined by the end of the 1940s. With maintenance decreasing more and more, vegetation soon re-established itself along the line. In 1949, Number 12 would soon make its last run on the ET and WNC before being retired and put into storage with an uncertain fate. The locomotive had been around for at least 32 years at this point, and with nowhere else for her to go, her fate seemed close. On September 24th, 1950, Number 11 was scheduled for the very last run on the ET and WNC's narrow gauge system before the line's official closure on October 6th. After the last run, the ET and WNC narrow gauge system was officially closed. In 1952, the last three engines, 9, 11, and 12, were put up for sale. Originally, engines 9 and 11 had been planned to be donated and put on display at Elizabethton and Johnson City. However, the offer was turned down. The locomotives would be put back into storage and eventually be scrapped. As for number 12, it was purchased by a group of railroad enthusiasts and was taken to Rockingham County, Virginia. And here is where 12 would start its first new life. In 
locomotive was purchased with the intention of having it run along a small tourist line called the Shenandoah Central. The engine was restored and repainted with the Shenandoah Central lettering on its tender before finally being transported on a standard gauge flat car to the tourist railroad. Number 12 also had three pieces of passenger equipment to give people rides along the line. Combine Car 15, a former ETNWNC baggage slash post office slash passenger car. Mining Passenger Car Number 5, an old passenger car from the 1870s. And Excursion Car 11, a custom car built in the ETNWNC shops. Number 12 would start its career with the Taurus Railroad in Rockingham County, Virginia in 1953 giving rides to enthusiasts who'd visit the railroad. However, this new life for number 12 wouldn't last very long, as in 1954, floodwaters from Hurricane Hazel washed away the tracks of the Shenandoah Central. As a result, the line was closed and number 12 was once again put up for sale with an undetermined fate. Hollywood actor Gene Autry expressed his interest in purchasing the locomotive with the intent to move it to his Melody Ranch in Hollywood, California for use in motion pictures. Unfortunately, Autry was quick to learn that moving the locomotive to California would cost much more than the purchase, and ultimately lost interest in the idea. And once again, number 12 had nowhere to go. However, one year later, a man by the name of Grover Robbins Jr., an entrepreneur from North Carolina, was approached by Autry, who offered the number 12 to the man. Robbins had bought number 12 to be used for an idea that he had when it came to his imagination. Robbins acquired some land out in Blowing Rock, North Carolina to build a theme park. Prior to this, many people who lived in the mountains of Boone, North Carolina remembered hearing the sound of whistles echoing through the hills on the ET and WNC. They eventually gave the railroad the nickname Tweetsie because of the distinct echoes. Therefore, Robbins decided to call the theme park Tweetsie Railroad. The engine was now going back to North Carolina. Number 12 was sent to Hickory, North Carolina to be restored and once again repainted and was delivered up the mountains by truck. The engine and the same three rolling stock arrived at Tweetsie Railroad where number 12 would finally be at its official home. Along with this, the word Tweetsie would eventually become number 12's official nickname. Grover Robbins Jr. and a partner of his, Frank Coffey, prepared everything for the park's grand opening. On July 4th, 1957, the park officially opened to the public and number 12 made its first run on the, at the time, mile-long track. The track would start at a train depot at the entrance, and number 12 would make its way up the hill to a picnic area where riders would get off and have lunch. Similar to what the Shenandoah Central did, only this time it was up in the mountains instead of out in a field in the middle of nowhere. Later on, the mile long track would be turned into a three mile long loop. The theme park was already a huge hit from visitors, but there was one problem 
Park only had the number 12 steam engine to run it, and it wasn't long until number 12 needed to have maintenance done on it. Now the theme park had a problem. If number 12 needed maintenance, that meant the park would have to be temporarily closed until number 12 was ready to run again. It was soon realized that the park was going to need a second steam engine. And this is where White Pass and Yukon 190's story comes into play. In 1960, Robbins began looking for a second steam engine to run at Tweetsie Railroad. However, there was an issue. Because number 12 ran on 3 foot gauge track, there weren't many locomotives left in the US that ran on that type of track gauge. Locomotives of that gauge were either in museums or scrapped. However, there was a sign of hope all the way up in Alaska. The White Pass and Yukon Railroad also ran three foot gauge locomotives on their lines. Also, if you remember, two of the ET and WNC 460 locomotives, number 10 and 14, were sent to the White Pass during World War II. But what happened to these two engines? In 1943, the White Pass and Yukon Railroad modified 10 and 14 to meet White Pass standards and put them into service on their line to help out with the war. Unfortunately, on Christmas 1943, a fire broke out inside a White Pass engine roundhouse while 10 and 14 were inside. And as a result, number 10 and 14 were destroyed in the fire, and became a total loss. The two locomotives would be put into storage until eventually being scrapped in 1946. However, there were still plenty of other locomotives from the White Pass that were still operational. In 1943, the military ordered 11 S118 class locomotives, numbered 190 to 200, from Philadelphia for use up in Alaska to help out with the war efforts. The S-118 was a locomotive built specifically for use in World War II, like its larger counterpart, the USATC S-160. 741 S-118s were built during World War II, with 53 copies being built afterwards. Alaska's S-118s were built for 3-foot gauge tracks, unlike other S-118s, which were gauged for 3-foot, three 3-and-3-8 three three inch gauge tracks, or 3-foot and 6-inch gauge tracks. The engines would serve the military in Alaska until the war ended in 1945. After the war was over, the S-118s were modified and relabeled with White Pass licensing. Along with this, some of the engines were converted to burn oil instead of coal, as well as get fitted with new tenders, as the ones they came with were a little too big. The engines would continue service with the White Pass and Yukon Railroad until being retired in the late 50s. And this is where White Pass and Yukon 190 story with Tweetsie Railroad starts. Robbins found out that the White Pass Railroad still had several steam engines in storage that were waiting to be cut up. In 1960, Robbins cut a deal with the White Pass to buy one of their locomotives to be used at Tweetsie Railroad. As a matter of fact, 
Robbins didn't get just one, but two locomotives. He was able to grab engines 190 and 192 from the scrap line. However, these two engines have totally different stories, and we're mainly talking about 190 here. 192 would be its own story, and a whole nother video. Number 190 would have to make a very laborious trip across the states just to get to Blowing Rock, North Carolina. The locomotive was repainted for being shipped across the country. Because 190 was White Pass and Yukon's first S-118, the engine was given the nickname Yukon Queen. From that day onwards, 190 would be known as Yukon Queen. The engine would soon begin its journey, first being transported by barge from Alaska to Seattle. Then the locomotive was lifted off the barge and loaded atop a standard gauge flat car and transported all the way to North Carolina. Finally, just like number 12, the engine was loaded onto a truck and driven up the hills where the locomotive finally arrived at Tweetsie Railroad. Number 190 was placed on a sidetrack at the park where work began on the engine. One of the tasks was to make the engine look similar to 12 in terms of silhouette. This included increasing the height of the cab, domes, and the stack. The engine was also converted back to coal. Finally, the engine was given a very elegant paint scheme to honor its Yukon pride. In 1960, the engine made its first run on Tweetsie Railroad trackage. Finally, number 12 had a partner to run at Tweetsie Railroad. Number 190. However, the story wasn't over just yet. Even though the two locomotives were now at a new home, they still had flaws that their previous railroads never addressed. And it would be years before these flaws were finally dealt with. During the 1960s and early 1970s, Tweetsie Railroad made an outrageous decision to number 12 and number 190. The engines were modified to look like 19th century locomotives by giving them diamond stacks, box headlights, and large cowcatchers. This was to make Tweetsie Railroad's theme park setting feel like it took place in the Old West. In the end, however, these modifications were not favored by a lot of people due to it just tampering the original appearance of the engines. And I'm gonna be honest, I kind of agree. You don't put 19th century modifications on a locomotive that was built in the 20th century. It just doesn't look right. These 19th century modifications were removed in the mid 70s as they decided the engines looked better the way they looked before the modifications. In 1977, Tweetsie Railroad would build an engine shop to make maintenance on the engines much easier. Between the time the engine shop was built in the late 70s, workers had been making improvements to the engines to fix the flaws they had that had never been fixed. The biggest change the engines had was to their tenders. There was one problem that both the engines tenders had which was never addressed. It turns out that their tenders weren't capable of holding the right amount of fuel needed to make them run. Number 12's tender was found to be too small to hold enough water. To combat this issue, the tender was made a few feet longer to make room for a larger water tank. As for 190, its tender held way too much coal and not enough water. 190 has always had the problem of having a tender that was a little too big, but this was a completely different tender compared to the one that it was given when it was shipped back in 1943. 
However, this tender still held way too much coal and not enough water. To combat this problem, the tender was modified to hold a lot less coal, and now the vacant space was used to give 190 a larger water tank. Since the 1980s, number 12 and number 190 have been operating without too many problems at Tweetsie Railroad since. these two would pretty much spend the rest of their lives up at Tweetsie Railroad, but we have one last question to ask. What happened to the railroads they formerly came from? As for the ET and WNC, the railroad's narrow gauge system, as of 1950, has since been abandoned, with only trestle bridges and a few lines covered by shrubbery being the only thing left behind. The company still operated its standard gauge routes for a few more decades, until 1983, when all operations of the line were ceased. The Green Bay Packaging Company of Green Bay, Wisconsin, ultimately acquired the railroad properties and reorganized the company as the East Tennessee Railway. In 1996, the company was then absorbed into the Genesee in Wyoming, an international operator of short-line railroads and continued to operate the former ETWNC standard gauge lines. Sadly, as of 2003, all operations that took place entirely on the ETWNC were ceased for good. Around 2012, all the old rails were being pulled up to make way for new roads. Only one portion of the track survives being used to serve the last few industries in Johnson City Yard. As for the White Pass in Yukon, the railroad still strives very strongly till this very day. The lines no longer have steam engines running on them, as they were phased out by the newer diesel locomotives. However, plenty of steam has been preserved from the railroad including one of number 190's sisters, number 195, which sits on display in Skagway, Alaska. Tweetsie Railroad wouldn't have been a thing if it weren't for the survival of number 12, and the park wouldn't have lasted this long if it weren't for number 190. Average people would never look into the history of locomotives that operate at theme parks because they're mainly there just to enjoy themselves and go on rides. But if you're a hardcore train fanatic, you will care for the trains there. Number 12 and number 190 have even managed to get Tweetsie Railroad on the landmarks of North Carolina. Now I think that's saying something. Tweetsie Railroad has been around since 1957 and continues to strive till this very day. Despite the few incidents that may have happened at the park since then, the two engines still press on, giving rise to their visitors. As of 2023, number 12 is now 106 years old, and number 190 is 80 years old. And I'm sure that these two locomotives will continue to operate at Tweetsie Road 
for many years to come.